what God showed Daniel in what for us is a story told in 12 chapters in the Bible is an astonishingly comprehensive prophecy because it covers details that you don't really get anywhere else and on, on one hand and on the other hand it says the same thing that all the other major and minor prophets are talking about and that is at the time of the end there's going to be a crisis between the image of man and the image of God that will will manifest itself in a battle that Christ will be victorious in that battle and the armies of this world will be <coughs> to use a big word discomfited or overthrown so our focus has been on the wonders that were shown to Daniel from chapter 1140 beginning with the king of the north rushing against the king of the south who's pushing at him and culminating in the rising of Christ in the eyes of the nations to the point where it says in Revelation chapter 1 every eye will see him so after they've this revelation has taken place. Turn to Daniel chapter 12. And the last part of these wonders and really the conclusion of the prophecy, the prophetic substance of what the angel reveals to Daniel is found in verse 3. And this, is, this follows the resurrection of the dead, which is the first thing to take place when Christ comes back. So in verse 2 it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's the resurrection of the dead, and it's in no uncertain terms a material resurrection. Some to everlasting life, and because there's a judgment that follows the resurrection of the dead, some are raised to everlasting shame and contempt, which means that if they are destroyed, their destruction is everlasting. In other words, it's the final and complete destruction of the rule of wickedness or the rule of the kingdom of men in this world. That's why it's everlasting shame and contempt. The way this world was run by the kingdom of men for 6,000 years will be remembered forever as a shame, the shame of human nature that fell upon this creation from Adam's sin through to all the sins committed in this world uh, to the point where sin is finally ended at the time when Christ is all and in all and everything that breathes praises the Lord. So verse 3 continues by saying, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So. It's a reference to people who are wise in verse 3. They're going to shine like the firmament. So what does wise mean in the context of Daniel? Wise means that God revealed to him what he was going to do to such an extent that through the, the details and substance of prophecy, Daniel understood that there would be the rise and fall of four major world empires, that they would dissipate or fragment into weak and strong nations that a period of a long period of time would go by several periods of time actually uh, would go by the messiah would would come then there would be a long period of time in the end michael would rise and all those things that daniel saw that's what made him wise so that raises a question who are the wise in the last days who are reading this are they people who have some special power of wisdom? Are they people that God kind of zaps with the Holy Spirit and then all of a sudden they, they can get their calculators out and find out what 1260, 1290, and 1335 really means? Is that who the wise are? Well, our point today, our premise today is, no, that's not who the wise are that will understand in the last days. The wise are people who read their Bibles and get what God's saying. In the simplest terms, the wise of this world in our time are the people who know what the gospel is. That the gospel is, is a, an idea that was promised to Abraham so long ago, in the beginning in Genesis, where God begins his account 
of, of everything that he means to reveal to us through his message. A promise that one day, through Israel, through him and his seed, through Christ, all the families of the earth would be blessed. You're wise if you know that. You know how many people in the world don't know that? Got some other idea in their minds? The wise are the people who understand the gospel and because of their approach to the Bible, not only do they understand the doctrinal aspect of the gospel, but they are able, by the use of the same approach, to easily understand cryptic prophecies like the, the, all the, the prophecies that are revealed to Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's image is so plain and simple to us that our Sunday school students understand it. From the time they're six, I was about six or seven years old when I first encountered Nebuchadnezzar's image. And I understood that at the end of all that, there'd be a kingdom that would fill the whole earth. I knew that when I was a little child. Why is that? Because God doesn't hide his wisdom from people who are open to his word. He hides his wisdom from people, from the foolish and the ignorant of this world who have no interest in his word or his plan or his will. No interest. And so therefore, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, he speaks to them in symbols in order to confound them. They cannot, he will not reveal his wisdom to people who would, by their nature, by their own uh, pride, I think, oppose his will. Only to people who are lamb-like in their disposition and are open to his will, whatever God's will is, they're perfectly acceptable with it. So those who are wise are people who knew the truth and believed it, lived accordingly. They'll shine like the brightness of the firmament. And then there's another group of people here spoken of. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever. So there's the wise people. Those are the ones who believe. And there's the righteous who turn many to righteousness. Two categories of people. So isn't that in the simplest sense what Jesus described in the Great Commission? Or I, think, I think verse 3 looks to me like what we're reading. What Jesus said when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Those who don't will be condemned. Isn't that what this says? Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and contempt. So this isn't any different, whatever, from what Jesus said. And he's speaking about two categories of people in the Great Commission. The people who go and turn many to righteousness by preaching the gospel, and the people who hear that and believe it. How is that any different from what the angel is telling Daniel here? It's exactly the same thing. So the simplicity of what is, and the depth, there's simplicity and it's also uh, deeply profound. Um, that the wise will shine like the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And if we were to boil this down to, the, to its lowest common denominator, this is what God requires of us. To walk humbly enough with him that we receive his word. And when we receive his word, to tell other people about it. It's that simple. All of us aren't preachers. All of us aren't teachers. But all of us are wise enough to take God at his word. So the, the premise this morning is that wisdom is not this mysterious thing that only the erudite of the world have. It's not the, the thing that you have to get from uh, our most prominent speakers. It's not something that you have to spend years and years and years in deep study in order to kind of unfold this cryptic message so anybody can hardly get a, a grip on what you're saying. That's not who the wise are. The wise are all the simple, poor, and maimed of this world who were in the highways and byways, who when they heard God's word, received it and believed it. And Daniel is part of that word. It's not that hard to understand. And the point, I've already made it, I'll say it again. 
the fact that our Sunday school students understand the, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's image, is an indication that you can be wise at the age of seven if you understand what that prophecy is actually about. So, what, is the Dan what, what happens then? This, this, con this message concludes with his reference to the wise. And then he continues in verse 4 saying, But you, Daniel, close the words, shut up the words, draw this to a conclusion here, and seal the book. What book is that? It's not the book of life. God has that. There's a book of life for the saints and a book of life for the people of Israel. Those books are open and it's a reference to that. In verse 1, everyone who's found written in the book. That's not what this book is. This is a different book. I would suggest to you that it's pretty obvious that this is the book of Daniel because he closes his book in a few short verses after the angel says, shut up and seal the book until the time of the end. In other words, this message would be fully understandable at the time of the end. And it would be kind of like a, a cryptic puzzle to those people trying to get something out of it until then. Especially in the times of, of Daniel, he, who could really look back or look forward and see the rise and fall of four world empires fragmenting into weak and small, strong nations that would go on for 2,000 years? There are aspects of this that are not known until the time of the end. So the wisdom that he's referring to is the wisdom that comes from understanding the truth at the time of the end, being able to look back at these prophecies and say how obvious this is. And again, that's the premise of what we're going to look at this morning about the angel's answer. Uh, then Daniel says, I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and on that river bank. And uh, one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, to so these two men are on either side of this river, and one looks at the other and he says, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? So you'd have to say, what wonders is he talking about? And the only sensible, the only obvious answer is the wonders that he's just been describing in the book that's been. So you take the book of Daniel and say, are there any wonders in it? What are those wonders? That's what we've been talking about, the one specifically referred to at the time of the end from Daniel uh, from 1140 to 127. Those wonders are the wonders we're talking about. The wonders the angels are talking about here, I think, encompass not only the time of the, the wonders at the time of the end, but all the other wonders that are referenced in the book of Daniel from chapter 2 out. Chapter 1 explains the circumstances in which Daniel finds himself in captivity. But chapter 2 with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that begins with a revelation of God to the king that Daniel interprets that is quite the wonder. You think this, the king was shown the whole future of the world in terms of its history, the collapse of the nations, and the establishment of the kingdom of God in one dream. The whole, in other words, from Daniel's time till, till the kingdom, the whole plan and purpose of God was in a nutshell revealed. That's a wonder. That is quite the wonder. And it's simple enough and clear enough because it's interpreted right there in chapter 2 for all the rest of us to get it. So now there's this question on the table. Well, how long? What's interesting about that question is there's time frames involved in it that are openly spoken about in these prophecies. The time frame of the rise and fall of these um, powers, these great empires. The time frame of when... Israel would be in its captivity and then return. That was a 70-year period. That's in, in, um, recognized by Daniel. It's in Jeremiah. The time frame at the end of Daniel's prayer till when, from, from where Daniel was making his prayer to, for, for forgiveness to when forgiveness would not only be the answer of Daniel's prayer for him and his people, but offered to the whole world through the grace of God embodied in the sacrifice of Christ. And that's in Daniel chapter 9. And then he goes on to talk about these other wonders. So there's a lot of wonders in Daniel that are encompassed in this question. How long? And wouldn't anybody in his right mind come up with the same question? 
If I told you uh, that the United States is going to have a period of economic prosperity, and then this was revealed to me, and I'm not saying this is revealed to me, this is hypothetical, this is just to illustrate the point of, of how logical it is to say how long, and then we would have an economic collapse, there would be chaos and anarchy in the streets that um, three quarters of the United States would be uh, destroyed by anarchy, that people would be wild, that most of us would lose our homes, some people would be shot to death, others would be burned at the stake. But then Jesus would come and save our children. You might think, um, how, how long is this going to take? When is this going to happen? Right? You'd start thinking about time frames. That's the way we think. So this is not a, uh, um, a strange question to ask in the context of everything that Daniel's been looking at prophetically. So he says, seal up the words of this prophecy until the time of the end. I'm back in verse 4, just picking up the context. Many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So he's saying at the time of the end, many would go back and forth across the face of the earth. So would you, you think that that, that that describes our time differently from any other previous time in the history of the world? We have transportation that enables us to run to and throw, fro across uh, the face of the earth in a way that was never before available to peoples. And it's been kind of an increasing, increasing with the technology of transportation. When they invented planes, Air, air travel, this really kicked in. And then knowledge was increased when, we, when the, the internet was opened up. There was knowledge before that. We had Encyclopedia Britannica in volumes that took up this amount of space on the shelf. And um, you could supposedly pretty much find out anything about anything in our set of World Book encyclopedias. No, they weren't Britannica, it was World Book encyclopedias. Uh, but when the internet opened up, that knowledge kind of exploded. And I believe that this is an indictment against the times of the end because many to and running to and fro is also a phrase used to describe the devil and his activities in the world, which, as we know, uh, is human nature at work. So human nature is sort of rampant to and fro all over the earth. And if that wasn't bad enough, the knowledge of good and evil is no longer a little tree in a garden now it's the internet where our little children spend most of their time in this knowledge. And anything you can do to slow that down and prevent it is well worth its, um, its conflict with what children would prefer to do. So that's when Daniel looks. He sees all this. He looks at these two people on either side of the river. And he says in verse 6, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand. And I think this is um, on the screen now. And his left hand to heaven. So he's standing like this. Daniel's thinking about all these wonders. And one man says to the other, how long? And then... There's a man clothed in linen who I think symbolized, either symbolized or was Christ in the future. He holds his hands up to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and a half a time. All right, so he gives him an answer that I'm going to suggest right now you don't need a calculator. You don't need to start with some with the collapse of or the construction of a mosque and then try to figure out a day, use a day for a year principle and try to you don't need that. Put your calculator away. You don't need it. Because you know you understand the truth. And you follow the meaning of Daniel's prophecies, right from chapter two out. So you don't need uh, a degree in in math or physics or uh, history in order to, to figure out the, this because it says in the last days you'll understand if you know the truth. If you can read God's word, you'll understand. That's the premise. Let's just see how that works this morning. You can understand this. This is not 
It's cryptic, yes, but it's cryptic to people that don't read their Bibles. It's not cryptic if you've read the prophecy of Daniel and understood it. So, he says, it'll be for a time, times and a half a time. And he doesn't stop right there and goes, okay, there's the answer. He continues and he says this in a reference to what he's been saying from the time of, because he's speaking about the time of the end here, right? And an understanding then and knowledge uh, of good and evil present in the world and men running to and fro their human nature. So that begins with verse 40. If you've got your Bible open, it says at the time of the end, that begins a different discourse in chapter 11. It starts a period. At the time of the end, you'll understand. It's a period when understanding is available for all this because we're looking back at it in history. We can see it and understand it. So he says, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, reading from the New King James here, it says scattered in this version, um, but they're the same, same word, and it means completely dispersed, or when, the, when they become a desolation because they've been scattered again. When the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. All what things? All the things he's been describing from 1140 to chapter 12, 3. All these things will have been accomplished. And what do they include? They include the conflict between the north and the south. They include this assault from the uttermost parts of the north. They include um, the pitching his tents in the holy land and the glorious land. They include his um, coming to an end and no one helps him. They include Michael rising in the eyes of the nations. And they include the resurrection. We know they're not in order because the resurrection is the first thing Christ does, does when he comes back. And this description is a full description of the work of Christ when he is back. Including drawing the king of the north into, his, into the conflict in the Middle East. And we only know that because we have other prophets that tell us that. Ezekiel 38, for example, says, I will put hooks in his jaws and bring him down. And uh, we... we generally understand and agree that this is Christ's behavior, his action, as um, his, his initial action, as first a thief in the night that then becomes revealed to the householder, surprise, he's in the house. And that means Christ is in the world when he starts this work. So it says, when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, in other words, when Israel has become a desolation, the third and final desolation that we've spoken about for the last uh, two or three weeks. All these things will be finished. Including Michael rising in the eyes of the nations. And so Daniel says, although I heard, I did not understand. But we do. Because we have the truth in the last days. Then I said, my Lord, what shall the end of these th things be? And he said, go your way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Well, if they're sealed until the time of the end, they're opened up at the time of the end. That's the time we live in. That's the time when all this is happening. Many shall be purified and made white and refined. That's you. That's the operation of Christ and the Gentile nations. But the wicked shall do wickedly. Boy, that's an, uh, an incontrovertible observation. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And that is spoken about everywhere else in the New Testament. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred ninety days, twelve ninety. And blessed he is he who waits and comes to the, the one thousand three hundred thirty-five. That's a third period of thirteen thirty-five. But then he says to Daniel, in conclusion, "Go your way till the till the end, for you shall rest." He's saying you're going to die and you will rise to your inheritance at the end of the day. So he's saying you're going to die and they're going to be resurrected. And that's, that, I think, was revealed to Daniel elsewhere in the message. So these are huge time frames. There's a lot involved in this simple conclusion. But what we want to talk about is what does it mean when he said a time, times, and a half a time if you don't have to be a math logician in order to figure it out or a student who just spent the last 20 years of his life deeply digging and excavating in, in the prophecies to kind of decipher this secret code that would tell you when the, the time, times and a half a time is. You don't need that. 
You just need to understand Daniel's prophecy. It has to be in the context of what God revealed to Daniel. This time, times, and a half a time. So, what would that be? How long is the question? Shall it be to the end of these wonders? Well, Daniel was given certain time frames in the prophecies that go from Nebuchadnezzar's dream to the second coming of Christ and the righteous shining as the stars forever. He was given several different time frames. The first one in Daniel's vision was in chapter 9 where he said it will be seven, 70 weeks of years or 490 years, 7 weeks of years rather, 490 years until Messiah comes and he's cut off. So we know from history, we understand that this is an accurate description of the time frame from Daniel to the, to the uh, first coming of Christ, the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, his ministry, and then his crucifixion. And his ministry just happened to be three and a half years. That was his ministry. So that's the first time mentioned in Daniel. They're not in chronological order. So from Daniel to Christ was 490 years. That's a time. So what were the times? Well, the times that are spoken of in Daniel from start to finish is what the times revealed in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And they're referred to as the times of the Gentiles. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream begins with the rise and fall of these empires, but it culminates, but it, but, but it, it doesn't really go into the detail of Christ's coming, except in chapter 9. So you got 490 years from Daniel to Christ, and then from, from Christ's first coming to his second coming, he describes as a long journey. And he said only the, 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 the Father had, knows the, the, the times and seasons involved. In other words, you can't use this prophecy to predict the year of the second coming of Christ. But I'll tell you what you can do with this prophecy. You can understand that the times of the Gentiles, when Christ came as a light into this world, after he became put, put an end to iniquity and brought in everlasting righteousness with his crucifixion, that for us is an observable 2,000 year period. It's two millenniums. And what are, what are those, what is that referred to? It's referred to as the times of the Gentiles. So, and we know that time begins when Christ was cut off. The gospel went out into the Gentiles through the work of the disciples, and we believe to this day because of that work. So that's the times of the Gentiles. That's a second major time period spoken of by Daniel. So that's a time, and then times, and what, what would these half a time be? Well, I would suggest to you that this is the second half of the seventh week in, in the prophecy given to Daniel in chapter 9 as an answer to his prayer. The work of Christ appears to take a three and a, to, to, to be special in a seven year period. The work of Christ when he comes is going to last for a thousand years. But there's a special seven-week period in which he's working with the nation of Israel on one hand and working to establish a basis of salvation for the, for the whole earth on the other hand. So it's described in Daniel as the seventh week, otherwise referred to by Dr. Thomas as the seventh heptate. That's a week of years. So the first half of his work took place in his first coming, that's three and a half year period, the second half of that week of years takes place when he comes back somehow. In his second coming, that's also a three and a half year period. That's why it would refer to a half a time because the time of Jesus' work with Israel appears to be a seven year period. I've run this by Jim Cowie. I've uh, looked all through Eureka to make sure that this is in agreement with everything we've understood prophetically that uh, those who have gone before me and those who I think are maybe uh, even more applied to these things than I am, there's no disagreement. It's just how they fit in together. Jim Cowie has a 50-year period and a 10-year period that he speaks about. This is also a three-and-a-half-year period, no question about it, 
described as a half a time. That half a time would be the second half of Christ's work, and I'll show you why I think that. Because it's going to take Jesus seven years to, to basically kill the serpent, to crush the serpent's head. His work with Israel is involved in his subjugation of sin. He spent three and a half years in his ministry describing uh, sin in the context of explaining how sin works in relation to the law. You've heard it said of men of old, you shall not kill. You've, you've heard it said of men of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, and then he describes that sin is not this thing out here in a law that condemns us. Rather, his whole mission in three and a half years was to explain to us that sin is really something in yourself. You have to own it. And he did when he went to the cross. That's exactly what the point is. We identify that when we get baptized and we identify with it every Sunday when we come here and break bread. Sin is internal. It's part of my makeup. And that was, it took him three and a half years to make that very clear. And his exchanges with the Pharisees, the way they came at him, and the way he, he answered them also explains how sin operates in the subtlety of human reasoning. Because that subtlety was laying one snare after another to see if it could catch him in that snare in order to destroy him. And it finally basically put him on the cross. That evil sin that was revealed to us in his three and a half years of work. Well, what about this, the second half, that, that half a time? Well, when he comes back, my belief is he's going to spend another three and a half years primarily working with Israel through the operation of Elijah's work with Israel because it's prophesied at the end of the Old Testament and Jesus affirmed this when he spoke of John in Elijah's role. He said, and indeed he will come, referring to, in that context, referring to the prophet Elijah coming to Israel as stated in the prophet Malachi. Last bit of the Old Testament says I would come and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. That's the work of Elijah but it's also the work of Christ who has now raised Elijah in the resurrection and sent him to prepare the hearts of Israel in the same way that John prepared the hearts of Israel for his first coming. So his second coming begins with the operation and in Israel as Messiah begins with the operation of Elijah's message to Israel uh, as he becomes this critical messenger. So let's look at this again. There's a three and a half year period spoken of in Daniel 9.27 and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's a week of years or seven years. And in the midst of the week, that is three and a half years after that work starts, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's when the veil was rent and the law was no more. The oblation was of no longer of any value because Messiah was cut off. That happened in three and a half years of this week that he's referring to. Many for one week. So it's interesting that at the time that Jesus returns, the first thing that he, he does, as we've spoken of already, is bring Israel to her knees. Two-thirds of the population of Israel is cut off, but essentially Israel is crucified and made a desolation. That's the shattering of the holy people we're referring to in the angel's answer to his question, how long? But Habakkuk 3 has this interesting phrase in it. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. What years would that be? Well, the only answer I can offer you scripturally is the seven-year period in which he's confirming the covenant of God, this covenant of life and peace, his, the way he's working with sin, both on a uh, personal level and as the Messiah of Israel on a, uh, first a national level with Israel and then a global level from the throne of David. So he says in Habakkuk 3.2, 3, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. What's the wrath? The wrath, the wrath is that def, desolation we've been referring to for weeks now, describing it in vivid detail through the prophets. God's wrath is going to be asserted in Israel before Israel is saved. 
but in wrath he will remember mercy. When he remembers mercy, he remembers his covenant, and that happens when he sees the rising of Christ with the saints like, cloud, like a cloud of people, of witnesses, rising in the atmosphere of this world, the political atmosphere, where the sun reaches a certain angle, the sun of righteousness reaches a certain height in, the, in his, his elevation um, in the eyes of the nations, where there's a rainbow. And the rainbow is the full overarching power of Christ's um, rulership in this world with his saints. That's when God remembers his covenant, the covenant that he's confirming with many uh, for one week in the midst of the years, make it known. So what's interesting is right in the middle of the, this week of Christ's work, Messiah is cut off and Israel is cut off. And it says that specifically in Zechariah. Two thirds of the, the population of Israel will be cut off. So that's speaking in the metaphor of the crucifixion of Israel. So there's one more illustration here that I want to show you, and it refers specifically to the midst of this, this seventh week of Christ's work, and that is sacrifice and salvation. Why it is that we say he's dealing with sin? Well, the crucifixion took place at the end of, in the middle of this week, in the midst of the years. That's this, this first half time, and then there's the second half time. It says in Zechariah 13, 8, in the whole land, says the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. So that's the Messiah being cut off. And then something interesting happens. In the midst of those years, Jesus is resurrected, right? Right, right dead center in a seven-week period, seven-year period. The first of that being three and a half years of his ministry with Israel, he's cut off, and two and a half days later, he's raised from his grave. So there's a verse in Isaiah that says this, with reference to the resurrection of the dead at the time of the second coming of Christ. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Now how does that happen? If it's two and a half years, uh, or two thousand years later, how in the world could you say that Christ and his bride rise together unless you're talking about the middle of his week. Because the resurrection of Jesus begins right at the point where his first three and a half year period is concluded with his work with sin on an individual level. He returns and the first thing he does in the beginning of the second three and a half year period of his work with Israel in converting Israel is the resurrection of the dead. So you look at it like that, in the middle of his week, in which he confirms the covenant with many, Jesus and his bride rise together. Is that hard to understand? Isn't that just so obvious? So, you know, it just depends on how you put things together. You have to, you have to read your Bible to understand this, but you, did, I, did we need a calculator to figure this out? And those are all the times spoken of in the time, time and a half of times. And at the end of that year period, Jesus will be on his throne. Every eye will have seen him. He will have been, occupied the throne of his father, David. And then as Jim Cowie points out, the work of the construction of the temple will have begun and it will take 50 years. And at the end of a 50 year period, that temple will be built. So I wanna just um, make one more point about that 50 year period in which all these stone columns are built and the, the stones and the arches are made. And uh, think about the amount of work that it's gonna to take to produce the components of a temple that is as big as the city. We've been looking at that um, in, on Wednesday night. Did you know that the Gothic cathedrals, the big ones like St. Paul's and, um, and the cathedral in Rome where all the, the Vatican has all the paintings of Michelangelo, uh, do you know how long it took to, for them to build those cathedrals? How much work is involved? Three or four generations of men over about a period of 150, 175 years to build a little cathedral which you could put in one corner of the temple. 150 years. So how would Christ build the temple in 50 years? How's he going to do that? 
Who's going to do that? Well, you could say, well, mortals can build fast. They can take stone and carve it out faster than anything you ever saw because they're immortal. They're powerful. They can just take a mountain and say, I need 10 columns, and all of a sudden there's 10 columns. The rocks fall away. you got 10 columns. Is, you think that's the way that's going to work? I don't. I mean, it could. Nobody really knows. It's certainly not a subject of prophecy. So we're in an area of total speculation right here. But what if it's like this? There's a verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 60, that says, Strangers shall build up thy walls. Well, if that, that sounds to me like what it's, what it's saying is the Gentile peoples of the world construct the components of the walls of the temple, which are pillars and arches and balconies and, and, and floors. And so how does that happen? Well, if Christ is in control of the whole world and he's put the kings in prison, and he employs everybody in the world, not literally, but, you know, there's a workforce that is global. What would it be like? I mean, the plan's easy. Every arch is the same. So all you have to do is have the plan for one arch and you can make all the pillars, just a lot of them. Well, it's a workforce like none has ever, the world has never seen before. What happens if the temple is made of, those pillars and those arches are made of rocks, granite, and other kinds of, of stone from all over the world, from every nation. What happens when you go up to the temple and there's granite from Australia, there's some other kind of, of stone from America, there's, uh, there's pillars made from the mountains in, in Brazil, there's pillars from mountains in, in Afghanistan, and the temple itself, uh, we don't know this, has uh, different colored stones in it, different colored from all over the world, from your nation and from my nation and from their nation and from their nation. This is just total speculation, but what if when you went to the temple, you could see this in the stones that the pillars and the arches are made out of? And then you understand this is a house of prayer for all peoples. What a marvelous thing that would be. And all peoples have worked in the construction of it. And the, the stone has come from all parts of the earth, from all the mountains of the earth. And this is a, a, a kingdom, like a mountain, that covers the earth. And this is the house of prayer for all peoples. Just a thought. I have no idea that that's true. But in the end, there's the land. And on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine in barrels with sediment. That's what wine on the leaves is. Fat things full of marrow, of wine on the leaves, well refined. It's got to be the sweetest tasting wine anybody ever drank. And we will sit at his table and drink that wine with him. And he will destroy on this mountain, this mountain that is a kingdom, this mountain that is the, 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 the pinnacle of the elevation of Israel and the temple. He'll destroy that with a law that proceeds from his mouth, the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken, and if God speaks it, it's done. He can say, let there be light, and light is created. And it will be said on that day, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, that's an understatement, that he might save us. This is the Lord, we've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation.